Christians. So we are starting Deuteronomy, which is the fourth book of Moses. I mean, or the fourth, the fifth book of the Pentateuch. It's the fifth book written by Moses. And so we're actually going to finish a whole section of scripture when we finish this book. And if you've been with us since Genesis and you know that we've taken the time to point out everything that points to Christ, at least what we could aggregate off the surface as we're going through. And we're astounded by the pictures and and not only the pictures of Jesus himself in the word, but also things that apply to our Christian walk. We know that we have been reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where it says these things were written as examples to us. And so we know that they are pictures of examples. And we know that we saw, you know, Moses delivering the children of Israel from, from Pharaoh in Egypt. And when they crossed the Red Sea, it's a picture of our deliverance. When we came to know the Lord, our salvation, as we are delivered from Egypt, which is always a type of the world system, the world itself. And of course, then we were with them in the wilderness. And many of us have been, you know, when we first get saved, we're baby Christians and we're just learning until we have to go through some trials and some testing to mature us in the Lord. And we we saw all those wonderful examples of them going through the desert, you know, their tragedies and their triumphs. And then, of course, we went through the book of Numbers and we came to the place where they're at right now. And that is right on the other side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Where they are encamped right now, they can probably see the walls of Jericho on the other side of the river. And this is the new generation, the next generation. Those that that were not those that died in the wilderness. They are the ones that are going into the promised land. And it is a beautiful picture of the promised land for us is those that are, we, we're in the wilderness, you know, we're, we're, we're saved, we've crossed the Red Sea, but there is that time where we're still living a life directed by the flesh, you know, according to the flesh, but we haven't matured. We've come to that place now where we want to cross the Red, we want to cross the Jordan and go into a life, one that isn't controlled by the Spirit. And of course, we know there's still battles, there's still examples. And as Moses is writing this book, he's writing it to a generation that he knows is going to inherit the promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses, of course, can't go in because he misrepresented God. And of course, for the most part, spiritually, he represents the law. And the law cannot enter in to that life of the spirit because the law can do nothing but condemn a person. The law is 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 where Moses the law came through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ and so the picture is there the examples are there and so we're going to get this um, kind of rehashing of the law and everything that God had taught the the children of Israel through the first four books of of Moses or the first five four books of the Bible but in a different aspect, in a different way, in a way that is um, more of an encouragement to follow the Lord and obey the Lord because you love the Lord, not out of a need or obedience because of your fear for the Lord or to earn anything, but just basically out of Love. So really the whole theme of Deuteronomy is love and obedience. But I love to use the what Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because remember, we've been telling you that, and especially when we've been in the New Testament on Sundays, is that that Jesus is God. And he is the same God that is God exists in three persons. They and they're one God. But they all share the same characteristics, the same, you know, personality, so to speak, or characteristics are found in each one. They don't contradict each other. So when Jesus was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, it's just the same as God speaking on Mount Sinai. 
There, there is no difference in, the, in what he is saying because it's all the word of God. And so with that said, we're just going to jump right in. But Deuteronomy means second law. It's actually the name given to this book from the Septuagint, which was, of course, a um, copy of the Old Testament written in common Greek or Koine Greek back in the second century B.C. by 70 Jewish scholars. And so they uh, did that to make it accessible to the common language at that time, kind of like us having the Bible in English now, kind of the same idea. And so, but, but it really, remember we've been talking about each of the books of Moses were given the name originally with the first Hebrew word that starts the book. And that would be words, or these are the words. So it was really the words. That was what this Bible is. And I think that's a good name for it because that these are the words of Moses spoke, you know, speaking for God to the children of Israel. One of the interesting things about Deuteronomy, and we'll find out and point it out as we go through it, it is the most quoted book in the New Testament. And it was quoted by Jesus himself many times. I was reading uh, Galatians chapter 3 today, and two different times Deuteronomy is quoted in that book. And I thought that was interesting. We're teaching Deuteronomy, and I'm already finding it in the New Testament. And so, and then of course, we know that when Jesus was tempted by Satan, he used the word of God and the obedience to the word of God as his, you know, um, defense or, 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 you know, answer to Satan himself. And all three quotes were from the book of Deuteronomy. So I, it's an important book. And it, and it is, and we can learn a lot here. We'll see repeated over and over again in Deuteronomy is to tell these to your children so they can tell their children. There is a, a heart in this book is the wisdom to pass it down to generation to generation. And think about a lot of the times when we're bringing it up here in Deuteronomy, think of it not just as the book of Deuteronomy, or just the five books of Moses, but the entire Bible. The Bible is something that we should um, be sharing with our families and with our spouses and something that we um, constantly rely upon for all of our life and practice. And so with that said, we're going to jump right in. Um, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1 verse 1 gives us the speaker and the location. It says, these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness in the plain opposite Suf between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahav. And of course, last week we looked at the maps at the end of Numbers and we saw all the places that they journeyed and, and of course we know right where they're at. And so, but we understand that Moses is the one who wrote the book um, there are those critics of the Bible that will say that Moses could have never wrote the book of Deuteronomy because the, there, they didn't have written language back then and there would be impossible for somebody like Moses to be able. And, you know, every time they, they turn the spade over there in Egypt or anywhere in the Middle East, they discover, oh, we were wrong. And, of course, they were uh, there was writing before then. And we actually do have one of the Patterns of Evidence movies that I bought in that bundle that I have not watched yet. And I should make it available. Maybe we should watch it. And it's the, it, he deals with the question, did Moses write the five books, write the Pentateuch? And so it would probably be something good to watch as we know that Tim Mahoney does such a good job. And we still have uh, plenty of room left in the theater seats for the movie Journey to Mount Sinai Part 2, which will be at the Greenback Theater uh, over here on Greenback and Garfield on May 15th, which is a Monday at 7 p.m. So we would love to have you join us. And uh, please think about it. Is it? Okay. 
No, he said Mother's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Always get those two confused. No. Anyway, so anyway, we know where this is. Like I said, they and really, what's interesting is we're. This is the Deuteronomy is actually like the last thirty days of Moses' life. You know, he's writing this book right before he dies. At the end of the book, he dies. And so uh, most likely the end of the book was written by Joshua, who they put it into the end of the book because, of course, dead men don't write. But um, so, but anyway, that, that um, you know, the 38 years of wandering in the wilderness is over. And they're really, like I said, from the end of Numbers until the end of Deuteronomy only covers, you know, a 30-day period, and really from ex the the from the point in Exodus until the one point in Exodus when they crossed the Red Sea until the end of the book that we're reading was only a 40-year period. So the Bible has a um, a lot to say for that period of time. And so anyway, we're moving on. We have the speaker and the location, but um, something to ponder as we see Moses. It says these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel. Turn back to, to Exodus 4. Turn back to Exodus 4. Of course, this is, you know, Moses at the, the end of his, um, it's really, this is his graduation day from his 40 years at the backside of the desert university that we talked about when we were there. And, of course, this is the burning bush passage and the calling of Moses. But the interesting um, back and forth with God, considering what we see at the end of Moses' life here, speaking to this whole generation of people that are going to heed his word as they go and follow Joshua into the promised land. Very interesting, though, how it started at the beginning. And picking up it in verse 1, of course, then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, "What What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it to the ground. So he cast it to the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. I don't blame him. I don't like snakes either. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord has said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when it took it out, behold, the hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew out, drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that you may believe that they may believe the message of the later sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land, and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now notice he's giving them all of this, you know, here, here's some supernatural stuff to put in your quiver so you don't have to worry whether or not they won't believe you or not. Here, you know, we've got all of this backing up not only the call and the direction of the Lord himself speaking to God directly, it should be just, yes, Lord, and go, right? But no, he says, he says, so the, the um, he said, Um, Then Moses, verse 10, said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And And so the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O Lord, please send by the hand whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, you will be glad in his heart. 
Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God, and you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. And so what do we see Moses doing now? Exactly what God called him to do. That's exactly what he did. God sees and calls a person but by, by what he sees, not what you see. We have to remember that God sees what he sees in you, not what we see. We look in the mirror, and of course we're going to see. I look in the mirror every day, and I said, you're not a pastor, dude. What are you talking about? You know, and it's like, but, but God you know, is the one who calls and he's the one who equips and all we're to do is be obedient. And that's why what's so wonderful with the book, with the theme of love and obedience, here is Moses being obedient finally to the Lord and fulfilling the calling of leading the children of Israel just like he was supposed to do at the beginning. But God, through his mercy and his grace, he'll use whatever you give him. You know what I mean? But how, t- how many times do we cut ourselves short by not being all in to what the Lord would have for us? Because he's going to do it anyway. He just chooses to use us so we can receive the blessing to follow in it. Or we can just wait until we're 120 years old to finally, okay, Lord, I'll do it, you know. So, but anyway, that's, you know, something to ponder. And then, okay, so we get the promise remembered in Deuteronomy. Let's pick up in verse 2. Going to verse 8 is the promise remembered. It is, he's, he's, he, this is the word Moses is speaking now. Or It says, it is 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now it came to pass in the 40th year in the 11th month on the first day of the month that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them. After he had killed Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt at Astaroth in Endri. On this side of the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Take and turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains, and in the lowland, in the south, and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to give them and to their uh, their ascendants after them. So th- this is, you know, rem- reminding them of the promise of the land they're about ready to go in and take. This is not, they're, this is, they're, they are just getting to go receive what God had promised to them back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is the land promise that is given and and. And it's God's land, but who is he giving it to? Israel. So when we see, you know, everybody wanting to fight over who's that land over there in the Middle East, we know that God has given it to Israel. That's who owns it, is because it's been given to Israel. God owns it, but he has given it to Israel. So we don't have any right to tell other people what to do with what God has decided to do with it. And that's why there's so many problems in the world because we want to give land for peace. And we talked about that, I think, a couple of weeks ago when we were, we were talking about, you know, the, 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 the whole deal of the century and how the whole world fell apart right after that. And uh, those things are not coincidences, by the way. But remember in Genesis 28, 13 and 14, that I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac... The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. 
And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So passed from Abraham to Isaac, and this is Jacob, now receiving the promise of the land that they would eventually get. But the, the, the sad part about it is, to this day, they still have not fully taken the land that was promised to them. They will actually not receive that until the millennial kingdom. And, you know, uh, during... David and Solomon's reign that was probably the largest the kingdom ever was, but it it never went all the way to the Euphrates. But one day it will. And so we know that's... Did you have something, Mike? Yeah. Well, it's the 40th year since they crossed the Red Sea. They left Egypt, and remember it was day one, year one, and then they had the Passover on the 14th day. So from that day, it was, it's been, it's been, it's the spring now, 40 years later. It's actually one month away from before they cross over in the Jordan. So it's actually, from the time that they, the, the manna stops, it's, I think, I think it's um, 40, about 30 days. Because they, well, it's 30 and then 7 because they crossed the, the, somebody did the math like that. But, well, 38 since they, because the first year they had to make the, the tabernacle and all that. So from the point, it was 30, it was two years be, before they were actually starting. Then the, after the second year, they were supposed to go into the promised land and they didn't. So they landed up staying in the wilderness for 38 for a total of 40 years. So it's 40, you know. Numbers are interesting in the Bible, and we'll talk a lot about that when we start our study in the book of Daniel, because it's pretty interesting. But anyway, um, what about you? You know, did you know that God has territory promised to you? And how unfortunate it is that we never go in and, and conquer all that God has for us. How often we, we uh, sell ourselves short, you know, by lack of faith, by doubt, by whatever it is, maybe... We're allowing sin in our life. What It could be, you know, you fill in the blank. But God has territory for you and I to take by promise in this land. You know, like I've always said that God, you know, so many Christians today are on the defense. Continually, their whole life is lived in defensive mode. And we're not to be, the church should be on the offense. We're the one to go and crash the gates of it of Hades and save souls that are burning from hell. A healthy church should be on the offense, you know, not in fear of anything, going out and sharing the gospel to whoever will hear it, you know, and so often the church is, is, you know, hiding, you know, behind closed doors, you know, don't want to get involved in issues because, you know, we're, we don't want to get the, we don't want the community to hate us. It, guess what? The gospel's offensive. It is. It just is, you know, and the Bible says it is. To those that are perishing, it's an offense. People don't want to be told they're a sinner. Nobody wants, I mean, I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like people telling me that I was a mess up and, a, and a, you know, deserving of going to hell. I don't want to hear that. But it's the truth. And, but the good news is, is that you don't have to go there because Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins. And we come to him in faith and we receive salvation and it's available free to anybody who will receive it. And so there, there, there is territory for us to take. And so we can only receive it by faith. And we'll, you know, we'll see that throughout, especially when we get to the book of Joshua, which is next. So... Anyway, we, we have the recognition of leadership, too, here, if we pick up in verse 9. Uh, and it says, And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you. 
leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with them. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you shall do. So he recognizes and uh, the leadership that he had set there and, and said that he was the one who appointed it. Of course, we know that's a New Testament example. Uh, Paul was the one who would go with his with Timothy and all of them on their missionary journeys and they planted the churches and it was up to them to establish the elders and the leaders. He established the church before he left with leadership. And that's the way that it always worked. But remember that it's God, though, is the one who does the calling. Because remember in Numbers 34, we were just there last week where it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, these are the names of the men who shall divide the land among you as an inheritance. So those leaders of those tribes were the ones that God had called. He named them by name and said, these are the ones. And so Moses' job was pretty easy. God did the choosing and all Moses had to do was confirm it. Say, hey, you're, the, you're it. And so it was a good thing. And so that's the way it is. Now, God calls, but man confirms. You know, the, the problem with the church today is there are many people behind pulpits that were never called to be there. God never called them. They made it as a career. They just made a choice one day. I'm going to be a pastor because I want to do it. But, you know, as my pastor always said to me, if, there, if you can do anything else in life, do it. Because, you know, the calling of a pastor is one that, 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 that will come with, with the price as far as, you know, being responsible for people when you teach the word of God. We're under a stricter judgment. That's what the Bible says. And so it's something that, you know, we want to make sure that when we put people in leadership position, that it, all we're doing is confirming what God has already done in their life. And so God, man, God calls and man confirms. But 1 Timothy 3, 1 says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. So that, but we see the New Testament model says that there is a place for somebody to desire to do the work of, and the bishop there, that's the overseer or the pastor, like what I do. That was what they called it back then. It was the bishops, you know. And so he desires a good work. So where does that desire come from, though? You know, the desire, you know, for me, that's, I know that the desire for me to be a pastor did, came from outside of myself. I know that it was not something that in my natural state is something that I would want to do. I told you guys before, before I was a Christian, before I got saved, I was deathly afraid of public speaking. You could not put, I would be shaking like a leaf. I couldn't speak. I was nervous. And, and when I got saved, it was like, that all went away. I could speak in front of a thousand people and it doesn't bother me one bit. So, well, you know, that's supernatural. That's God doing that. I didn't do that. So, um, but, but we have to ask ourselves, if this is what the New Testament says, then, then if God is the one who does the calling, which we know because Paul and Peter and John would all say that they were apostles called by God for the, by the will of God. And so, but we have to remember that the desire comes from the Lord. Because if we remember in Psalm 37, verses 3 and 4, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. That's where they're going into the promised land. And feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. That isn't a name it and claim it verse. That isn't a, well, if I just, I delight myself in the Lord and he's going to give me everything I want, right? No, it means he puts the desires in your heart. We know that. Anybody who's walked with the Lord for a while knows that, that the things that I wanted before I was a Christian, I don't want anymore. 
the, the life that I used to live doesn't, that doesn't please the Lord, I do not want to do. And the things that I do now that, that, that I want to do are put there by the Lord to please the Lord and only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we know that, that the desires of our life have changed since we became Christians. They do. You know, you get that hunger for the word of God, that desire to, to be around his people, to find some place to serve. Those things didn't come to you before you were a Christian. It wasn't until afterwards. And so the calling, the gifts, all those things that come from a life according to the spirit, as you enter in by faith, God will reveal those things to you and put a desire in your heart. It's Chuck Smith always said, you know, hey, you know, somebody would come to him and go, hey, you know, I really feel like doing a homeless ministry. He'd just say, well, sounds like you just found yourself a ministry to do, you know. You, you know, go ahead, start it, you know. We'll support you in it. And so that's the way that it always worked, you know, because Chuck Smith understood that the Spirit put that desire in that person's heart to do something in that area. Hey, go and do it. And so that's what we see here. Moses is just recognizing the leadership needed in order for the children of God to be able to exist. It's just like a church. You know, we have elders, we have, you know, assistant pastors and pastors and leaders to serve you guys. That's what we're here for. If you have a need, please let the church know, you know, and we will, we will do everything we can to serve you in that need. Or even if it's a difficulty or a challenge or something, we're here to help. And that's what, that's what um, Moses is, is telling them. And so now we're going to get into remembering the tragedy of unbelief. And this is uh, always the difficult part of, the, of, of this section of Scripture, but it's something that we need to deal with, which we talked a lot about in the book of Numbers. And so verse 19, it says, So we departed from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites, as the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not, be, do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come. And the plan pleased me well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed and went up into the mountains and came to the valley of Eshkol and spied it out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. Remember, it was the, the big, that cluster of grapes so big, it took two men. And I actually shared a picture of a giant cluster of grapes from Israel from that same area. It's pretty amazing. But that's what they did and, and, and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. Notice it, it's the Lord our God is giving us. He said to go in. They didn't need to send any spies in the land. You know, that, isn't that like us, though? We, 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 you know, w- you know, we feel like God wants to send us someplace. Instead of just going, we want to feel it out. Let's send some people over there to check it out. Let's research it a little bit. You know, God says, go, just go, you know. That's what he wanted them to do. But no, they needed to send 12 men up. And Moses thought it was a pretty good idea. But look how it turns out. It says, um, it is a good land which the Lord our God, nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us up out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Remember, we talked about the giants, the Nephilim that were there. Then I said to them, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. These people saw, these adults that were there in the land, 
had saw all the miracles and all the judgments that came upon Egypt. You know, they we're talking plague after plague after plague against one of the mightiest armies on earth at that time. But how soon do we forget what God has done for us? Because we're not, we're not looking beyond our circumstance to what God can do, but we're looking at our circumstance and what we can't do. And so we automatically forget that God is with us. And the Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents and to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. You know, they, what they, were, they were in their tents complaining about, you know, that God hate, hated them when all the time God loved them, provided for them showed them the way, gave them a fire by night to keep them warm and a cloud by day to shade them from the heat in the wilderness, provided manna for them every day that they would never starve or never... And and even in the 40 years, their sandals didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. God did that because he loved them, not because he hated them and wanted to destroy them in the wilderness, but they didn't believe it. They didn't receive it. And so, and it's a, such a sad thing. That's why it's the tragedy of unbelief. So just to remind us about it, let's turn to Psalm 95. And this psalm is great because it starts off with such a praise to God for, for what he has done for us. We need to remember the, the great gift that God has given to us from saving us from our sins. By, putting, by his son going and taking upon himself the punishment for our sins and dying on a cross for them and providing a way for us to be fully pardoned from every sin that we could ever commit, past, present, and future. And not only did he provide us the, the, the pardon for the penalty for our sins, but gave us a promise of an inheritance of the future, of a promised land and a life, an abundant life according to the Spirit that we have received already, past tense. And so what should be our natural response from that? Should be obedience. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. God showed his love to the children of Israel. Just go in. It's all yours. But, oh, there's giants in the land. Forget it. We're not going. So, verse chapter 9, Psalm 95, starting in verse 1. Oh, come let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock, Jesus, of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. Everything belongs to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our, Lord, our maker. For he is God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Man, isn't that a glorious intro? Just right there, think about that. That is, should be the song of our heart continually. And if we're singing that, if we're believing that in our heart, we should have no problem doing what we're leading or going anywhere that God leads us because of that recognition. But the psalmist would go on today, if you will hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people 
who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. That is the tragedy of unbelief. That is what we saw in the book of Numbers. By this time period, Moses, those people have left a trail of grave markers through the wilderness. And um, I guess there is a picture. I haven't been able to find it. Um, I know Brandon Holhouse had it on his study in Exodus that Phyllis and I saw that, that shows that there's a place in the place in Midian where we believe that the real Mount Horeb or the real Mount Sinai that was in the movie where there's actual graveyard, just a graveyard as far as you can see of rocks piled up with tombs like rocks for tombstones all in this one area, which is just, you know, in this dry desert land, that is the, the, the tragedy of the unbelief of this whole generation that saw God's power, that witnessed it. How we walk by faith. You know, we've been able to see glimpses. I mean, I know when, you know, delivering me from a life of drug addiction and, and, and the sin that I was involved in, man, that's enough for me. But these people actually got to see, you know, um, hailstones and fire come down and, and darkness and, and, you know, the blood, rivers turn to blood and frogs come out. I mean, they saw all kinds of stuff. They saw the Red Sea part right before their eyes and they crossed on dry land. But yet they still wouldn't trust in God enough to go in to the inheritance that he had promised to them. So that's it, it, just an amazing, but the, notice that the psalmist makes something important and the writer of Hebrews picks up on it for you and I. So turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Of course, Hebrews, obvious by the title who it was written to, Hebrews. And of course, there was a context to this. And this was a writing to Hebrew believers, Jewish believers that were tempted by persecution to, to, and, and by, you know, the threat of, of losing everything for continuing to trust in Jesus and by grace alone, through faith alone, were tempted to go back into Judaism, go back to the temple sacrifices, back to the works-centered relationship with God. And um, the writer of Hebrews is warning of them that, using... They did, he didn't want them to suffer the same tragedy of unbelief that their forefathers had suffered. So that's why in verse 7 of chapter 3 of Hebrews, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, They always go astray in their heart. And they, ha they, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confession steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that those that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. That's why they couldn't enter. And basically the psalmist is saying, I mean, the writer of Hebrews is saying right here that, that unbelief is a sin. Not trusting in the Lord and the promises he's have for you is a sin. And so we need to be aware of that. And, um, you know, that's why, what, what does doubt come from? The darts of doubt, the fiery darts of doubt come from the enemy. That's why we need to have our shield of faith up. 
That's faith, trusting in the Lord to, def, you know, to block those things because we know that unbelief is a sin. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard, heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter in, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. And he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from him. That is a beautiful picture of what is guaranteed for us when we, put, when we keep trusting in the Lord. When we continue to live a life of faith, trusting in the Lord. You know, you have a rest. You have a peace. You know, you're not worried, you know, the, 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 that you could be taking the most dangerous steps to man in your walk of faith, but if you know you're doing it in the will of God, there's you don't you're not worried, you're not concerned. That's why the that's why James would say, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because the 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 Christian, when he's going through turmoil and trial, we're not worried. We shouldn't be. I mean we do. I mean we fail. I mean I'm not saying that, that this isn't you know the struggle with failure, but but overall, there's a difference when we're going through things than when the world goes through them because they have no hope. You know, it's the end of the road. I'm going to die. What am I going to do? For us, it's like, yeah, it's going to be hard. But I know that, you know, if worse comes to worse and this doesn't work out, I got heaven. I'm going to be, I mean, I, I, we, we got a brother right now who's, you know, waiting for that that call to go home and, you know, that, 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 you know, we're having joyful times visiting him and, and talking to him because, you know, he knows where he's going. I'm not worried at all about, he's more concerned about the people being left behind than what, what's happening to him because he knows where he's going. And so, anyway, so that, you know, we want to make sure that we don't suffer the same tragedy of unbelief that they did. That's why it was written for us. And we covered that a lot. And that's what um, is going to be the exhortation and encouragement of Moses all through this book is to, you know, when they're, you know, love and obey. God loves you. Obey him because of your love for him, not because of your duty. And that's really the key here. And it's really the, 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 the law that is mentioned in Deuteronomy is not written to, it, it isn't written to us, but it is written for us. It is that the, 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 we're not under the law anymore because we're saved by faith through Christ and we're under the law of the Spirit now. But God's principles have never changed. And they are there for us to learn from them and to apply them to our daily walk, just like we just read. And so we would do well to heed them. And so let's move on now. Deuteronomy 34 through 40. We only got a little bit left to go. But now it's remembering the faithful leaders. Now we know what this is about. Of course, in verse 34, And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. 
And to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. Now remember, he was the one, hey, we can enter in. There'd be food for us. You know, he was like, let's go in and take it. Let's just go now. You know, he's like, don't listen to them. Let's do it. You know, I like people like that. Those are the kind of people I want in my life. I could use some Caleb's, you know. Hey, let's just go do it. You know, go in, let's do it. You want to do that? You know, if you ever met people like that, they're pretty exciting to be around. You know, they're always living by every step of faith. You know, they're the one who will encourage you. Hey, man, you want to go on a mission trip? Let's, let's do it. I know somebody who can help you. Let's, you know, you know they, they get all excited, you know, kind of like Don, Joy's husband, Don. That dude is like, he's like a Caleb, you know, and he'll just start telling you stories about what they're doing over there in, in Vietnam. And he's just like, you know, and if you, it's like he, he liked that, that movie Before the Wrath and he wanted it in Vietnamese. So I'm like, he's like, is there any way, you know, so he's got me all encouraged. I'm texting Brent and Brent's like, yeah, let's try to get it to work out. And so those are kind of fun things, you know, there's, there's, there's territory to take. Let's go do it. So that's the way Caleb was. And we're going to see him and, and he, he's pretty cool old dude when we get to Joshua. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Verse 37, the Lord was also angry with me for your sake, saying, even you shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones of which of, of your children, which you will say will be victims, because remember, that's what they said, you call us out here in the wilderness, our children are going to be victims. To, you know, they were whining and complaining. He says, you know, those that you said were going to be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red See, so um, we were remembering the faithful leaders and those that were willing to go out and do it. And of course, God is, is, is mentioning something here that I find is very interesting. And notice in verse 139, which we just read, Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there to them, and I will give it, and they shall possess it. That's interesting. Who were they? That was everyone 20 years and younger. So, you know, the Bible's very clear that, you know, we decided somewhere along the way that 18 was the time that we became an adult. But the Bible never looked at it that way. And we need to understand, and we as Christians can look back, and I can look back at my life. I didn't know nothing when I was 20. And so, you know, people really haven't developed into manhood until, you know, until they've experienced life a little bit. And so, but we live in a culture that's anti-God and, and they're, they are wanting kids now to make their own decisions. And it's, it's not biblical. And so when we see like this story that I shared recently, the new bill would have California parents lose parental rights at age 12 because kids want to shit switch their genders. So they, they, they're actually pushing this law right now that would make, you know, kids 12 and under to be to make their own life decisions for them at an age that they're, they're not, you know, they're not there. And we see our culture and society sliding down. That's why when you see this story that just came out yesterday, Disneyland invites children of all ages to spend the night with trannies and queers at, during Pride Night. So... You know, stay away from Disney, I would. I mean, just, you know, um, they definitely don't deserve our money. I mean, they're losing money hand over fist to continue to push this agenda. We just saw, and I just shared about the, the, uh, the store that decided to have Drag Queen Story Hour on a Sunday over in Curtis Park area of Sacramento, and it was packed. People brought their kids there to watch adult men dressed like... And, and you can see because God's attacking the children and they, they want kids to be able to make their own decisions. And God says, no, there is an age of accountability. There is a time period that takes for people to get to that point to know the difference between good and evil. You know, and so um, we need to be aware of that. And so, but notice in Psalm 22, verse 6, 
train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It is our job to raise our kids and our children, even into adulthood, encouraging, encouraging them to follow the Lord. And, you know, just like, you know, Moses, the old man, ta- teaching the young people there, go and inherit it by faith. Trust in the Lord. Believe in him. Don't believe in the world. Don't go back and believe in the stuff that you learned, in, that your parents learned in Egypt and they dragged with them in the wilderness and wouldn't enter in by unbelief. And so, but in the New Testament, we have Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And that is going to be uh, Moses' encouragement to the fathers that are reading this letter, that are hearing this, to raise their children in the way of the Lord. There is only one source of truth, and that is the Bible. And if, you know, parents, grandparents, any influence on young people, it doesn't matter. Um, Use the Bible as the source of truth and instruction for people's lives because everything else is falsehood. And so we need to remember that. And then finishing up uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 41 through 46, uh, this is remembering the sin of assumption. That is, you know, that, that, you know, that God's just going to go ahead and do it when he told you no. You know, how many times, I hope there's, you know, I hope I'm not the only one that, that forces a door open when God closes it. I mean, I hope not. I mean, I'd feel pretty s- silly if it was only me, and I know it's not, so... Then you answered and said to me, we have sinned against the Lord and we will go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. And they didn't like the consequences. You know, they were, oh, you're going to spend 40 years. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll go up now, you know. And when every one of you had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, tell them, do not go up nor fight. For I am not among you, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountain. And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days according to the days that you spent there. So again, you know, the, you know how often that we don't want to pay for the consequences. People just don't like it when they must pay the consequences of their sin. I mean, there is a forgiveness for our sins, but a lot of times that we have to suffer consequences for them, you know. And we live in a society that doesn't think that, that people need to pay consequences for their sins. You know, the, the, we're, we, we have a society and culture now that if you do a crime, you're the victim. You know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to see. But how often, you know, people, you know, get presumptuous about the things that they're doing here. And we see it a lot. So that's just, that's it for this one. But... You know, we want to make sure that you and I are entering into a life according to the Spirit, entering in by faith. And so let's finish up in John 14, which is really interesting because I really tie this into really the whole study of the book of Deuteronomy. And I'm only starting at verse 1 to get the context. This is right after the, the Last Supper. Uh, and they are on their, most likely on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will be arrested. And as they're walking, Jesus is teaching them. And he knows that they're troubled because of the things that he said. Maybe they're starting to understand that, that this will be the night that he will be, he keeps telling them, I'm going to be betrayed. One of you is going to betray me. And so they're, they're anxious, they're worried. And Jesus says in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. 
Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. He will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him and he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So the encouragement of Jesus to his disciples, just like Moses' last word to the, the, the the generation that was going to go inherit the promise. He is speaking to the disciples that are going to go inherit the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing truth. It's the same thing. He's telling, Moses is telling the children of Israel, if you love God, if you love him, keep his commandments. If you and I love Jesus, if we love the Lord, we'll keep his commandments. But out of love, the obedience comes from just a response for what God has done for us. It always has to be that way. Then it's not by the Spirit, it's by the flesh. Then we're doing it to earn something from God, and we don't want that. We want to enter in by faith, receiving what God has for us by trusting in Him, and then walking in it. So with that said, I, uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just come before you and we thank you for the book of Deuteronomy. We thank you that these things written to a generation over 3,000 years ago that were about ready to enter in to receive something from you apply to us monumentally today. Lord, that we can receive these things and, and understand them and apply them to our lives and use them in the, in, in the things that you have for us. And God, I pray for everybody in this room and even myself included, Lord, that if there's things that you are calling us to do, uh, steps of faith, uh, territory to go receive, that we would, by the leading of your spirit, boldly step out in faith and do those things and receive those things and, and be used by you and obey you because of uh, the things that you want to do in these last days. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time together, and we give you glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys.